scholars started to look at, at the text within the Bible less so as, you know, a, a, a pure historical theological record and much more of forms of ideology and propaganda to promote ideas. What we discover is that these are very heavily biased. They're, they're very programmatic, very late expressions of what this world actually looked like. When it came to the worship of Asherah, uh, which, which is something that, that by and large took place within the household, women played a very, very prominent role um, in the practice and performance of this religion. And this is obviously a real, this is part of the problem, it seems. The people say to Jeremiah that we've been worshiping the Queen of Heaven for, for forever. Our forefathers were worshiping the Queen of Heaven back in Jerusalem long before Nebuchadnezzar ever came and, and, and invaded uh, Jerusalem. And all this time when we used to worship the Queen of Heaven, things were good. Uh, we were prosperous. Wow. Our nation was, was, you know, stable ever since Josiah basically started getting after us for this, that's when things started to go to hell. Welcome okay. back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm in a different location right now because I have to do some, uh, some babysitting. But uh, anyways, uh, Dr. Kip, so man, I, I wish we had more time, but this is a huge topic. But this will be for a course, and you're going to get all of the time you need to dig into this amazing subject about the ancient Israelite traditions that predate the text of the Bible. And so if you watch my channel for a period of time, you'll know that I talk about this stuff a lot on my channel. I did a video where I read the uh, text that is passed down by Eusebius and Philo of Byblos about this ancient Phoenician theogony, I guess you would call it. It's kind of like Hesiod's text where it's got all these different gods and the successions, but that mentions these gods named El and Elion. And there's two of them. One of them's El, the other one's Elion. And then there's a Yahweh. And then there's all these, there's Asherah. And there's all, these, there's all these different gods. And, and so that's the Phoenician side. There's also the ball cycle. We have all these different traditions all across the Levant. And I want to ask you, what do we know about this and what does archaeology and, um, and and manuscript evidence show us about these texts and what like where, where do these where do these ideas coming from? Wow, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, so the uh, I mean, we know we know quite a bit, um, but also frustratingly, there's 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 a lot of gaps and things that that, that we we just don't see. Um, maybe a way to answer this question is to is to sort of go through uh, how some of how some of what we came to know what we what we did happened. So, you know, from from the time that the Bible was was being copied and, and reproduced, you know, through the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and, and into the modern world, for most of that time it was just widely accepted that the presentation of history and religion that we read about throughout the Old Testament was a was just a, a, a clear, um, historically reliable picture of the religious landscape. Um, and then when, uh, when, archaeolo when archaeology proper uh, started to, to, to develop as a, as a scientific academic discipline uh people started digging in and around the 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 area and at first you know digging in uh in great centers like in uh in in mesopotamia in nineveh in babylon um and uh and some of these these great centers uh we started discovering all sorts of you know comparative literature uh, that looked an awful lot like what we see in the Bible. And that had people scratching their heads going, wow, you know, maybe, maybe there's, maybe there's more to what's happening in the Bible story than we first, at first thought. And then when they started digging in and around Israel, 
uh, the the great pioneer in this was uh, um, um, uh, well, there was there was Otto Eisfeld at first, but then William Albright really uh, developed what we what we recognize as so called biblical archaeology. Right. Um, and this was founded on the expectation that if we just open the pages of our Bible and we pay attention to what the text is saying, we're going to go to these places, find we're going to dig them up, we're, we're going to find them. Um, and that didn't happen. Wow. Like the, the, the amazing thing was that time and time and time again, archaeologists would, would look at what's, what's said in the biblical text. And when they would, would go to these digs what they discovered was something that was in in many instances dramatically different right than than what the bible promoted so what really happened was uh, a, a recognition that hold on you know the if the bible is not providing an accurate clear picture of this religious world then what is it doing and that has that has really, I think, caused a, a bit of a revolution within uh, within biblical studies, where wow. um, scholars started to look at at the text within the Bible uh, less so as you know a, a a pure historical theological record, and much more of forms of ideology and propaganda to promote ideas. So we can look back and we can see, yeah, you know, there is history in here. I mean, there really was a king, Omri, who ruled in Samaria. Um, but the way that the Bible presents this guy is so different from how, you know, the historical record presents this guy. Let's pay close attention to what the Bible is saying about him. But what we discover is that these are very heavily biased they're they're very programmatic, very late expressions of what this world actually looked like. That's what I want to ask you about. You said it's a very late expression. Yeah. How what, can we can scholars pinpoint when this transition from polytheism into monotheism becomes the norm? No. Okay. Um. It's it's very very difficult to do that. Um, and there's a whole complicated issue here that I, I don't even really get into this in my course, this whole complicated issue of uh, when we can even start talking about a Bible or even a Torah is a, is a, a, a sticky issue. Um, we have, and I think even, even all the way into like the Hellenistic period, uh, the idea of monotheism is complicated and it's not clear i think there's a there's a movement that you can kind of track towards that and uh, you know at, at various points i've done this in some of my videos where I've, I've i've shown there's no dates on this but i've i've shown basically like uh like a like a timeline where i've i've isolated a, a handful of individual texts which appear to be moving from this old polytheistic worldview into something that's more monotheistic. So, you know, stuff that you see, you know, places in some of the Psalms or in Deuteronomy 32, the so-called Song of Moses, or even in, in something like the, the, the Genesis one uh, creation story, um, you know, looks like it, it preserves this, these early polytheistic ideas. Whereas some of these later, this later movement towards monotheism you see more clearly presented in places like Ezra and Nehemiah um, or some of the, 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 the late prophets like, like Malachi or uh, Haggai or, you know, even second Isaiah. But even there, it's, it's like the edges of this is very fuzzy. You know, I'm thinking about how, you know, Euhemerus comes along and sort of changes how, these texts about these gods are done. Now all of a sudden there's this push to make the gods literally exist. And like Zeus all of a sudden has a tomb in Crete or, um, and then so the, the text that I was referring to in the beginning with the, the Sanko Nietzsche text, that's from, and that's a Phoenician text. It's not a necessarily Israelite or Canaanite, but um, there seems to be a influence on the Euhemerization side 
whereas all of a sudden Saturn is a king on Earth and, you know, he's circumcising himself. And um, these are stories that are happening on Earth in a time period. And people are people think these exist. Do you think there's the, the do you think the Old Testament text, the Torah, for example, let's stick with the Torah. Do you think that these those texts are s- sort of like a, an example of that, of euhemerization of and, and the, the, like, I'll just throw an example out there. Asherah, okay. mm-hmm. do we have do we have examples in the text? Because because it seems that a lot of these things are after the fact and Asherah is being banned. And all of a sudden, Asherah and Baal are the gods that Jezebel worships. Therefore, they're bad. Do we see anything on the flip side of that with Asherah? Maybe some like remnants in the text that say like, oh, look, they were actually still worshiping Asherah or no. Is it way? Are we way past that? You know, so one of my I I think one of my favorite texts uh, within the Bible does reflect something like this. Um, There's a and I spend quite a bit of time actually in my course uh, dealing with the the fascinating text in Jeremiah chapter 44 um, after, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's second invasion of uh, Jerusalem, where it finally destroys the temple and burns the city uh, and leaves it desolate and exiles all of its prominent citizens. Uh, Jeremiah is given the choice to either leave with them or stay behind. And, and he chooses to stay behind. And, you know, chaos erupts as a result of this, this vacuum that's created. And he ends up basically getting kidnapped and dragged down to, to Egypt to dwell, to live with these, this, this, group of Jews in exile in this place called Tafanas in, in Egypt. Um, and at one point, uh, there's this interesting account where um, he gets into it with, uh, in particular, the women who are living in Tafanas because of their ongoing worship of uh, this this deity identified as um, Malachet Hashemayim which is translated as the queen of the queen of the heavens or the queen of heaven, which wow. scholars tend to identify with Asherah. But what's, what's really, really cool about this story is, is a few things in the first place. Um, it's one of the very, very few places within the entire Hebrew Bible where a group of women is actually acknowledged right right um and and this is important because what we learn from this actually aligns with what we see within the archaeological record that when it came to the worship of asherah uh which which is something that that by and large took place within the household women played a very very prominent role um in the practice and performance of this religion and this is obviously a real this is part of the problem it seems for jeremiah because he's constantly you know one of the things that the women say to jeremiah is that you know we do all these things we bake these cakes for the queen of heaven and we and we we basically lead and um uh structure this religious ceremony and we're doing so with our husband's permission and approval, like they're, you know, they know what's going on. They see that they're, they're right with us doing this. Right. And, uh, and this is a real problem for Jeremiah. Um, one of the things that, that, uh, that they say within this text, which I think is also very telling the people say to Jeremiah that we've been worshiping the queen of heaven for, for forever. Our forefathers were worshiping the queen of heaven back in Jerusalem, long before Nebuchadnezzar ever came and 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 invaded uh, Jerusalem, and all this time when we used to worship the Queen of Heaven, things were good. Uh, we were prosperous. Wow. Our nation was was you know stable. Um, things things it, it seemed to have been an efficacious uh, religious activity. Uh, and ever since, I, I think at this point they're they're starting to, uh, to to reflect on the historical reality of what Josiah's reforms actually looked like. Uh, they say, you know, ever since Josiah basically started getting after us for this, that's when things started to go to hell. So wow, that's incredible. They're making this clear connection between, you know. Th- 
the observance of this this religious practice and in particular this this deity this asherah the queen of heaven the the participation of women within the cult and they're they're saying you know they're they're making an historical connection here and they're saying yeah you know things were good do you think <laughs> when this happened do you think this is um influences the later idea of like divine wisdom sophia by the greeks mm. the, the hellenistic jews that are um one of the texts that i'm thinking on, on top of my head is the sirach and there's also oh, yeah. this wisdom literature and it's always constantly talking about wisdom as a female aspect she is so great wisdom or sophia i guess in hebrew is chakma but like there's this like idea that wisdom is always in the feminine is do you think this has this might have something to do with asherah uh, I think it's possible, um, and this is uh, and th this is sort of a frustrating thing because I think I think what you're getting at is um, is is more of a like it's a I think it's a it is a late development sure. whereby um, this idea and, and maybe this is the best way to put it like what we we've got we've got the the traditional religions of ancient Israel and then you know, with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile, and then the uh, uh, the end of the Babylonian Empire and the emergence of the Persian Empire kind of creates this black box where we have kind of an idea of what, what happened before, and then we have these th this idea and, and these surviving texts and traditions that came after like right. in the in the hellenistic period and very frustratingly there's like this this gap um and we can't see what happened you know in between that point but i think there's there's probably some currency to this idea that whatever chokma uh was this sophia this this wisdom figure that 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 ben sira uh regards and we read uh, about in the book of uh, Proverbs as well. Whatever this figure came to be uh, in the Hellenistic period, yeah, I think you can make you can make a case that um, the Asherah figure, which was was heavily suppressed uh, by the people who who redacted and collected the traditions, which came to be the Hebrew Bible maybe this is the best reflection of of what she was like um i don't think you can make this direct connection it makes a lot but of i think you can sorry. you can say you know this is probably what you know a, a similar respect to how she might have functioned that in, makes a lot of sense uh, in the ancient religion yeah my last question and I'll, and by the way just want to keep reminding people there's more on this in the course this is how many hours? 13 is the course? hours. 13 hours. <sighs> that's amazing. 18 lectures. What, what a resource that's going to be to have at your side, to be able to look into, go back to, take some notes on it, use it as a, as a tool, as a resource for your studies. I'm going to be doing it. Um, my last question, I just want to end on this. This is kind of a fun one. There are some people who think there's evidence of King David. He's acknowledging another God's existence. Someone pointed at it and said, look, if he's acknowledging that God exists, then... There must have been a this, this must have been is, a time of polytheism. It's pretty even even um like apologists will uh will acknowledge that there is at minimum an obvious awareness of other gods and not just as like like lifeless idols but actual deities who could do stuff in uh in the ancient world right in in ancient israel and we see this replete throughout the biblical text and one of the best places to look for this is in the writings of the prophets when you see uh many of the hebrew prophets talking about uh foreign gods uh particularly uh those of the eighth century like hosea amos first isaiah um uh micah when they talk about other gods it's always with this recognition that they're they're real and that they can do things yeah um 
And their promotion tends to be that Yahweh is just way better than all these other gods, right? right? Yeah. He's in control. These other gods are just minor deities. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating thing because in Christ, like l- later times, it becomes this, they don't even exist. They're false. Um, I don't know if maybe Elijah and he has this duel with the ball priest. I don't know if there's that's starting to happen then maybe or not, but like, because it's almost like your God is not even real. Look, you can't even do anything. Look, I can I can call down fire from heaven. You can't do none of that stuff. But if you go back farther, like Moses, for example, in his duel, whatever you want to call it, the the priest in Egypt, they're actually making stuff happen. Their their magic's working. So I wonder. It's it's interesting. Like, what? How does that transition? It's probably a long time. Probably takes a long time for that to ensue. It's not overnight. Um, no, de- definitely not. And I think I think it's something too that 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 doesn't even happen until much much later. Like, uh, you know, there there's I think there's still even among the 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 writers in you know after the Babylonian exile, there's there's this recognition that 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 these these beings are real and they could do stuff. So. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's something that takes place over a, over a longer period of time, and it's and it's something that if it ever, um, if if it ever is actually completely uh, disregarded, doesn't happen. Certainly not uh, during the time period that 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 we would want to, or I, I think that that we would we would. Um, uh, into it, it should have happened. There's a uh, uh, something that's happening quite recently here. Um, within the next uh, several months, there is actually a group of scholars um, getting together for a conference addressing just this question and basically uh, promoting this idea that the even the the concept of monotheism is just not something that you can ever talk about with right. regards to the bible or the the biblical religions because it's just uh we have such an anachronistic understanding of what that means it, it just doesn't even apply wow that's amazing and it's like you know, it makes you wonder out of all the gods that came to be the known as the the god somehow this yahweh and i'm, I'm sure i'll show it on the screen right now as i'm saying it this is the idol of, of Yahweh that we have in the museum. This little dinky gold character. Now he's the he's the one outside space and time all of a sudden. Like King of the Universe. He won the game of the gods. Yeah. <laughs> but um anyways, the course is in the description. Use my link and uh I'm definitely gonna be using I cannot wait to have this course and use it as a resource in my my personal studies. Thank you, Dr. Kip. Awesome. And, You're and welcome. You have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.